Good morning, disciples. And thank you, Joy and Reed, for bringing us into the presence of worship this morning. We are so glad that you are here. Welcome to those that are with us online. Today is an amazing day because this is the day the Lord has made and we will. Amen. For those of you I haven't had a chance to meet, my name's Patty Opperly, and I am honored to be the pastor here in this beautiful paradise of Homosassa serving alongside an amazing team of people. For those that are here in person, we've our ushers and greeters, you've had a taste of our music ministry. We have our amazing tech team. This morning, I am blessed and honored to serve as liturgist as our new resident bishop, Tom Berlin, is here with us and will be sharing the sermon with you. Um, he's been our bishop for five months now, and uh, we are grateful that he is here with us. He'll be sharing a little bit more about his story because it's always better to hear the story from the person themselves, amen? Um, but I wanted to share, um, I was blessed even before I knew who Tom Berlin was, I had come across this book, Restored, Finding Redemption in Our Mess. And I was completely blessed when I found out it was our new bishop who had written this book. I highly recommend uh, because friends, if we're honest, we're all a little bit of a mess from time to time, right? Um, so this morning also wanted to let you know that I hope you will join us after immediately after the worship service for our indoor picnic put on by our men's serendipity group. Plenty of tickets available at the door, and I hope you will all join us. If you'll join me in prayer, please. Most gracious God, as we come before you, we have entered into this space with a variety, a variety of emotions and thoughts and feelings this morning. But Lord, you meet us where we are. And Lord, no matter, we all come before you with one purpose. We are here to worship and honor you this day. In your holy name of Jesus, amen. One of the most fun things about being a pastor in a church is when we get to receive new members. And so this morning, Bishop Berlin and I would like to invite, we'd like Stephen and Joanne McDaniel to come on down, The Price is Right, along with Nina and David. We are so grateful that they have joined us, and um, it is a wonderful day. So Joanne and Stephen, we look forward to you all getting to know them as well as Nina and David. I love David's shirt. I'm feeling a little Jimmy Buffett coming on. Also, while, um, here, come on, no, come on this way, come this way. We want the congregation to see you, but you gotta say hi to the choir. <laughs> yes, there is always space. And so as I shared with these four when we met for orientation this last week, that we as people of faith don't keep our, we don't keep our faith private. That what we'll do is share a first set of questions that Bishop Berlin will be leading about, they will be affirming publicly their faith in Jesus Christ. I will then share with them the questions about them being a part of this local church. Yeah, I really think it's important. The great thing about joining a church, every relationship needs renewal. Is that your experience? Yes. So in a friendship, I, I got to see a friend of mine last night in Tampa. I met him in kindergarten. We, we spent one year together. We were in one year together in college, our senior year. We've just been lifelong friends. And last night, he and his wife were there, and Karen and I were there. And, and I was able just to say again, hey, I just so appreciate this friendship, what it means to me. You have to renew all your relationships. So today you get a chance to renew a relationship. And it's your relationship with Christ and with the church. So I ask you this question on behalf of the whole church. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Do you reject the evil powers of this world? And they do exist. They do exist. And do you repent of your sin? And if so, please say, I do. I do. Do you know what I like about what they just did? They didn't mumble. They were, did you hear the clarity of that? Whenever we confess, whenever we, we do things in church, we're going to do it with a clear voice, and I, I just thank you for that. Next question, do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression, 
in whatever forms they present themselves? And if so, please say, I do. I do. It speaks to what we stand for, but also what we stand against. Third question, most, perhaps the most important question, it's the question upon which everything else is based. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church that he has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? And if so, please say, I do. And now that you have proclaimed your faith to Jesus Christ our Lord, that you have chosen to live out your faith through this local congregation. So as members of Christ Universal Church, will you be faithful to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? And as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And as a member of the household of God, that they have already shared their faith, we're offering to you that we are commending these people to, your, to our love and care. And we need to say that we will do all in our power to help them increase their faith, to confirm their hope, and to protect them, or to per perfect them in love. Let us share with them. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's welcome our new brothers and sisters. So what Stephen and Joanne and Nina and David are receiving is not only a certificate of membership into this church, but a welcome letter as well that I am your pastor, we are your church, we are available and we are here for you as you are here to help us as well to increase our faith and confirm our hope and perfect us in love. But also this church had created two volumes of our history and so you have some light reading. Um, there'll be a quiz next Sunday and see how you're doing on it. But I hope that you um, you all have a chance to get to know them at lunch. May oh, I know Stephen and Joanne have to run off after worship, but um, in our weeks ahead to get to know each other. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Before we begin our points of invitation, so Bishop Berlin, I wanted to to share with you some goodies from our church. One of the things that we do is we give bears to people um, because God bears all things. Um, I, of course, a coffee mug. It is your first time with us, but not your last, I hope. And um, also, we shared with you a couple of the volumes of our church history. So we are grateful that you are here. Thank you. And also, our, our um, amazing district superintendent, Reverend Dr. David Allen, is with us as well. And when you come over for lunch, he's going to share our blessing with us. So welcome. We are glad that you are here as well. So now, our points of invitation. As we are reminded that these are not just announcements for you, but these are information for you to have that even if this is not something you particularly are interested to be a part of, you may have someone in your life that is. So it's always a point of invitation. This uh, point of invitation is for our amazing food pantry that due to the way things are operating, our food bank is not able to always get these resources any longer. So we're reaching out again to you and thank you for your response for boxes of instant mashed potatoes and jars of pasta sauce whatever um, ever you feel called whether it's red or white not wine but pasta sauce also your empty egg cartons would be greatly appreciated and 
Donna, our administrator, had this wonderful idea that as summer is coming and it can get hot and uh, we all just need a break, she's starting free Monday movie madness, a matinee, and it begins tomorrow in our theater. She's, she picked for the first movie, Heaven's War. What she's going to do is start the movie at 10 and then she'll start the movie again at 1. No reservations needed, just if you have a moment or, or some time to get away, you are welcome to just come into the theater. She's going to have popcorn and water for you, but you're welcome to bring a treat or a refreshment. So just to let you know for that, we'll be doing that on Mondays. Also, Jim Grutzen, who is our Stephen leader, has heard from some of you that you would like to become or are interested in learning more about what it means to be a Stephen minister. So he will be um, exploring that with you on Tuesday, May 30th at 10 o'clock in room 106. Also, he is going to be reigniting the SOAP Bible study, Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. A time to come, just bring your Bible and enjoy what God's going to do. Concert coming up. I hope you're all going to be here with us Sunday, June 11th, 2 o'clock. We have several of our local folks who are singing either in the Hernando Harmonizers or in the Suncoast Harmony Chorus. Again, great way to bring a friend, a neighbor, maybe someone who might be feeling a little lonely or isolated, a fabulous way to spend the afternoon. And previously at another church I had done this and I, the Holy Spirit said, now is the time because we need some joy and excitement. And Twig Wilson, I found out, is an amazing artist along with several others. But what we're going to do is paint in parable. And what will happen is we're going to meet in the fellowship hall. Twig will have a picture painted already, and she's going to lead us in instructions of the parable, painting the parable, um, the lost sheep. And along that way, while we're waiting in between our paint strokes, we'll be looking at the couple of varieties of the way this story is told in Scripture and let the Spirit lead us in wonder and as we wander in our painting, our painting skills. It's a lot of fun, and I look forward to you all signing up. It's either you can do that in the office or uh, there is a sign-up sheet here. Uh, very important. Please help. Go ahead and write down your information on the attendance pad, and um, if you have a prayer concern, if you have something that you would wish us to know, we appreciate if you have a change of phone number or address. But now, friends, let us stand together as we sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
And if you'll join me in this call to worship. A new day has begun. Hope wins. A fresh start is granted. Faith wins. Today you have the opportunity to do something new. Hope wins. Come, let us worship God who is inviting us into life in a new way, a way that transcends death, a way of hope and faith. Love wins. Let us worship Christ who overcame death to give us new life. Amen. there really is a rhythm that when you do something a little different this morning we are grateful for the many ways that your gifts that you have returned back to God are visible being here together in this beautiful sanctuary is one the opportunity to reach out to the many many people in our community through our food bank is another I'm not sure if you had heard yet but one of the ways our men's ministry is connecting with our brothers and sisters in Homosassa is at Nature Coast they're reaching out to the homeless population through clothing through resources and on Sunday they serve a meal to about 30 35 people well our men's ministry said how can we help you and what they said is when we have our monthly luncheon if we will just provide an extra 35 meals and then we once a month are serving folks that might otherwise go hungry thank you for how you're reaching out our amazing women's high tea last week we had over we had 55 plus women wearing gorgeous hats and drinking amazing tea but it was a chance of fellowship and you use that as a point of invitation there were people who don't normally attend this church and experience the love of Jesus because we had that opportunity. So thank you for your offerings. Today we're inviting you, you had in your bulletin, to a second mile giving that every year at our annual conference, there is an opportunity to reach out beyond the local church. And this year, our annual conference offerings are going to go to two things. One is to a scholarship at Bethune-Cookman College. In fact, uh, Reverend David Allen can share with that because he's a professor there at that school. And it's in honor of Reverend Dr. Geraldine McClellan. Reverend McClellan was the first woman of color ordained here in the Florida Conference, 1982. It hasn't been that long. She's paved the way, and this scholarship is going to go help for those who are struggling through seminary financially. I can attest to that. Um, and it will to help that pastors can be raised up and nurtured here within our Florida Conference. The second is going to our Warren Willis Camp and Conference Center. Um, in fact, our youth, that's one of the other ways that you help support our church, is you help make sure that our youth have the opportunity to go to camp. Um, and our, our kids are going the week of June 26. But camp is an opportunity for adults and children to come and experience Jesus in a sacred space, unlike any other, with joy and laughter, commitment and kindness. So we invite you to make a second mile giving if you are able to, just designated annual conference gift, and you can... Uh, make it out here to the church and we Brandon and I will be taking a check with us then to annual conference in just a couple of weeks as Brandon serves as our lay delegate to annual conference.
So friends, thank you. Let us pray. Most Holy Lord, as, as we come before you, we are reminded that absolutely everything belongs to you. You have called us to be your stewards. So we return with joy a portion, Lord, that you exponentially increase so that so many who don't know your love and care and compassion can meet you through the work done through this church. We come to you with a humble heart. In your holy name of Jesus, amen.
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. know the Holy Spirit was in the place today. Thank you. We could say amen and go home, but we're not. We come before, together, we come together before God to lift up prayers. What a praise. Thank you so much, choir, and thank you, Dixie, for your leadership in, in this wonderful, faithful ministry. This past Thursday, there were some um, that joined me. We had lifted up Gloria Ferguson. Actually, she passed away last Sunday morning while we were in worship, and we celebrated her life on Thursday. Um, as I shared last week, the sweetness and the spirit of the Holy Spirit is just was tangible. So many of you carry that gift and you make such a wonderful difference in people's lives. Thank you for being such a powerful representation. Shirley, we're continuing to lift up your daughter in prayer. She's going to begin cancer treatment soon. Nancy, good news. Uh, her husband Malcolm is home. We are grateful for that. Um, also, Chuck, I'm glad you're here with us this morning because we weren't sure you were going to make it. He said he needed a night off and headed to the emergency room for a little stay. But we're grateful you are doing well. So friends, I know that you all each have come into this space with a variety of joys and, and places that maybe is a little bit of a struggle. So we want to offer you a chance to let the Spirit lead you I'm going to share again some names of people who so appreciate your prayers throughout the week. Please continue to keep Pat Blake and Rose Davis in your prayers, as well as Joyce Hesketh and Joyce Johnson, Brady Lay and Fran McCready. I'm glad you are here this morning. Ernie Miles, Chuck Peace, Ron Powell, we continue to keep you in our prayers. Sharon Rapp, Helen Schwebes, Sandra, you're getting closer each week to getting that collar off. We're grateful for that. Jim West and Susan, we continue to lift you up in prayers. Now, let the Spirit lead you. Holy Lord, we come before you. You are our healing God. We trust, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual, that you love us beyond what we can even imagine. And Lord, even in those places and times when the healing isn't as we desire, we trust your, your compassion and your grace. Thank you for sending alongside brothers and sisters who will hold us and walk with us, love us, and remind us we are never alone. Lord, thank you for the leaders in this church. Thank you for Bishop Berlin and his leadership in this Florida conference, for Reverend David Allen, for his leadership in our district. And Lord, may we continue to be reflective of your spirit as we lift up all of those, whether in the government, the school system, the medical field, our construction workers along Highway 19. May when people see us, Lord, they see you. 
So we come before you. This prayer you taught your disciples, we proclaim you are our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now please stand as you are able, that Jesus is all the world to me. Good morning. You know, I just think that that anthem that we just heard was, was above average. Can we say that? I know we're not supposed to notice or rate or, you know, but I, I just felt like the Lord was with us in that moment. Would you agree? And I appreciate it. Here's what I appreciate about you all. You applaud it. But I think in church, we should sometimes wildly applaud. Because why not, right? Why not really celebrate? Because it was the, the organist and the accompanist on the piano have been working really well together this morning, amen? amen. And um, your company, she's got musicality in that, in that anthem. Did you notice that? Musicality is not, do you know the notes? It's do you know what the intention of the notes are? That, that's what that's about. And then the choir, we had a soloist, she was wonderful. We had a choir that sang so beautifully behind her. And then, Dixie, you, you're really bringing it. So I just think we ought, to, we ought to wildly appreciate this group of people. Wouldn't you agree? Thank you all. Yeah, I really appreciate it. It makes a difference. And, and the nice thing I know is if the sermon starts going south, I'm just gonna say, do it again. Just do it again. It's really nice to be with you all today. Um, I'm, I am a newer bishop. I've been here for five months in the state of Florida. I visited the state in the past, but I've never lived here. I'm from Virginia. My wife's name is Karen. We have four daughters. They live two in, Rebecca and Catherine and their husbands live in Memphis, Tennessee. 
Hannah is our third daughter. She's gonna be married in August. She lives in Austin, Texas. And our fourth daughter, the reason my wife's not here with me today is our fourth daughter is about to take another great adventure and she is, I think, gonna be getting on a plane uh, this afternoon. She'll be headed to uh, Portugal for a month. And so um, we're, we're all always, you know, if you've got a family, you know what that's like, right? There are everybody, a lot of moving parts, amen? So um, anyway, it's just great to be here with you. Today, I'm, it's Ascension Sunday in the church. It's the day that we remember Christ ascending into heavens. We're gonna be reading the book of Acts. And in the, the first five verses in Acts chapter one, Luke tells us that when the, the day came that Christ would be taken up into heaven, he, it says, giving instructions to the Holy Spirit, the apostles whom he had chosen, after suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them for 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So for 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples and he tells them again about the kingdom of God. But he's saying goodbye. They thought goodbye was at the cross. Hey, isn't it good that the goodbye didn't come at the cross, amen? The goodbye came at the ascension. And this is Ascension Sunday. They could not have been there without grief and loss. And yet Jesus was going to give them a word of hope. And it's interesting, they, they, they wanted to know, you know, what, what do we do? What do we do? And we're going to read about that in the text that you're going to see in just a moment. But the first thing he said to do is he said, be together. Be together. Gather, he told them. And that's not in the verses I'm supposed to be reading. It's, it's the verses prior to that. He ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you've heard from me, how John the Baptist baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And he's, it's a foreshadowing of the coming of Pentecost, which your good pastor will tell you about next week. That's not my sermon even though I have many I'd like to share. <laughs> so listen now and hear the word of God for this Ascension Sunday, verse six through 14. So then, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? And he replied, it is not for you to know the times or the period that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in, Ju in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who's been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. This ends the reading. Oh, we're gonna go all the way to the 16th verse, aren't we? Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. And notice it's the 11 remaining disciples. Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. Now here's a little thing Luke tells you. All of these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women. And these are the female disciples who had been with Jesus, including Mary, the mother of Jesus. Just imagine that. Can you imagine being in a room praying with Mary, the mother of Jesus, who had been there from the time that the angels told her of his birth through his teaching, his ministry, 
his crucifixion, and his resurrection. She is the first disciple who ever believed in him, and she's still here in the book of Acts, in this upper room, as well as his brothers. I wonder if you'd bow your heads and pray for me and with me. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable to you. Lord, there's a thing that happens in the preaching of your word when the Holy Spirit begins to speak to us in ways that we can only explain as the movement in the, the voice of your spirit to our own. No preacher can do that. No pastor can orchestrate that. It comes from you. And so I pray for that moment in each of our lives this day. Amen. A woman arrives home at her uh, house and there's a note on the counter and the note says, took the kids hiking, be back at 7 p.m. And it's four in the afternoon and she doesn't want to admit it, but she's as happy as she can be. She could not be any more thrilled, and it's not she loves her husband, she loves her children, but for just a few hours, do you know what she gets to be? Alone. And some days, can we just admit it, some days alone is good news, amen? I mean, because when you're alone, it's freedom. When you're alone, you get to do you. Right? Like you, if you want to watch TV, you watch TV. If you want to take a nap, you take a nap. Nobody's going to know what you did with your time when you were alone. And she enjoys it. She really enjoys it. And then seven comes. She's kind of looking down the, out the window, and she's waiting for that car to pull up. And then 7.30 comes. Now how's she feeling? Worried. And, and, and not just worried about like what's going on, but sometimes alone can become lonely. Have you ever had that experience? Have you ever had that experience? Where alone, like it, it doesn't feel like freedom anymore. It feels like something different. All of us, all of us want to belong. All of us want our people. We want that experience that she has when the car pulls in the driveway and she says, oh, they're here. There's something about belonging that's really important, don't you think? You know, I was, uh, before I became a bishop, before they made me a bishop, I was a pastor in a church in a sanctuary that looked a lot like this one. I, I must admit, when Patty walked me through your building, when I walked into this room, I was like, oh, wow, this feels so familiar. It was a similar layout. Handbells on this side, choir on this side. And I, uh, I remember in that church we had a preschool. And there were two hard weeks in the preschool. The first week we called cry week. <laughs> it was cry week. Because the first week of preschool, when the little children were brought in, not all of them, but many of them just walked in and knew this was going to be horrible. And the reason is their parents were dropping them off. And sometimes when the parents dropped them off, the, the parent would, would cry too. Some of the parents cried because they're like, I'm going to be so lonely without my child. And some of them cried like, thank you so much. <laughs> and, and it didn't matter. Like either way, especially the mothers of twins, I noticed. They were always like, thank you. I'm a little teary here because I haven't had sleep for years. And, and, but but they, they dropped them off, and the parents would tear up. But the children sometimes would cry for like three, four days in a row because they assumed that their people were leaving and that the people here were, were, were scary. I mean, they, they didn't know anything about these little children. They didn't know anything about those teachers. And they just made the assumption that because it was new, it was bad. There was a second emotional week in preschool. You know what it was? It was the last week. And sometimes the last week became cry week too. Because on the last week, the children didn't even, especially the threes and the fours, they, they didn't have a word for it. But what had happened is that over that school year, they had realized that when they entered that room, they belonged. 
These are my people. These children, these other kids, I, I know their names now. These, these teachers, the teachers were amazing. Because the teachers thought about them. They thought about what would they enjoy learning. They made it interesting. It was fun. They had recess and playground. And in the last week, the, the man came who was the one-man band, and he had symbols between his knees, and he, you know, he, he did all that once. And it was just always fun. And so the first week, they cried because they were afraid they were alone. And the last week, they cried because they knew they belonged. And your whole life... You gravitate between those two spaces. There's just something about a community where we belong. And Christ calls us into community. In the book of Acts, we see how to gain confidence that we belong to God and belong to each other. It's what the book of Acts is all about. It's about belonging to God and belonging to each other. Jesus had come and those 40 days had preached about the kingdom of God that he was ushering into the world. And these disciples wanted to belong to that kingdom. They wanted to belong to a kingdom where your life actually matters. Where it matters if you show up. A, a kingdom where broken relationships were not always the last word but where people extended forgiveness to one another for things that they had done, where people experienced grace, where people experienced the transforming power of reconciliation with God and with one another. They wanted to be in a place where Jesus had said to them, you know what, the poor should be lifted up and, and you can live in such a way that you can share with other people what you have, and it'll be enough for everybody. Jesus had taught them that there, there were miracles that were possible, that people could heal from their harm. And everything he talked about about the kingdom of God, they wanted to belong to that. But the question is, how do we belong? And the interesting thing that I think that's really interesting in verse 4, which I didn't read. I, read, I sort of shared that with you before the sermon. He says to them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift the Father has promised. Don't leave. Because I don't know about you, when things get rough, do you know what I always want to do? I want to scatter. When things get hard in a relationship, in a, in a family, in a friendship, when things get hard, I don't know about you, but I want to scatter. I want to just go off and be by myself because being by myself sometimes feels like freedom. But what Jesus says to his disciples, he says, hey, I'm going to leave, and they know, they know he's, this is it. And they've got all that grief and all that sadness, and he says to them, gather, gather, be with each other. Because in being with each other, you're going to find what you need. And so they go to that upper room. And then when they get to the upper room, they ask, when, when Jesus appears to them for the very last time, the very last time that, that, he, that they're with him, they look at him and they say this. And Brendan, I don't know if you can find the verse. It, it may be, it may, I don't know if it's verse 6. I didn't note it. It's my problem. So when they had come together, they ask him. There it is. Hey, can we all give Brendan just a little hand? Can we give Brendan a thank you? I appreciate that. And I know we've got others, and I've forgotten your name. Brendan, what's your colleague's name? Ivan and Twig. Ivan and Twig. Can we give Ivan and Twig a hand this morning? Because, see, here's what you may not know. We're doing this together right now. It's not me. So, Lord, look at this question. Lord, is this the time when you will do what? Read it with me. Restore the kingdom of Israel. I want you to read the whole question this time, but I want you to really punch up the word you. Lord, is this, come on choir, the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel. I mean, some people just can't ask enough. 
I mean, Lord, it, it's, it's not enough that you descended from heaven and took on the form of a man. It's not enough that you taught us about the kingdom of God. Lord, it's not enough that we've seen you walk on water and raise the dead and heal the sick. It's not enough that you were just crucified, a man on a cross. It's not enough that you were resurrected from the dead. Lord, now we want to know, is this a time when you... you will restore the kingdom of Israel. Because the truth is, no matter how much God gives us, don't we want just a little bit more? Is that your experience? I hate to admit it, but I'm like that sometimes. I can sit with a bowl full of gratitude and still say, Lord, could you just level off the top? Do you ever, this is probably going to mess up the video and the audio, but can I sit on that pew for a moment? Can I do that? Do you ever come to church and you think to yourself, I want to go to the perfect church and I kind of deserve it because I'm that kind of good person. I am that good. And then we sit on a pew and we look up front at the cross and we say, Lord, is this a time when you will create the best church? Because don't you want to belong to the perfect church, everybody? Raise your hand if you'd like to belong to the perfect church. Come on. <laughs> Now raise your hand if this is the perfect church. Oh, you, you old bunch of liars. You're lying in the sanctuary. You're lying right there in the sanctuary. I mean, I, you did it. some of you did it with a smile on your face. I don't know how you did that. There isn't a perfect church, friends. Perfect church would mean perfect people. And God help you if you ever become that. God help you if there aren't sinners in the pews trying to heal their lives. God help you if there aren't people that walk in here and say, you know what, my life isn't together, my life's kind of a mess, my life isn't just right, and I'm here because I need the Lord. Amen? Amen. See, we've got to decide what church is about. Oh, there are folks who want the perfect church. Think they're going to create the perfect church. But friends, I'm talking about what church really is. And church is a place where people that don't have it all together come and they, they say prayers of confession where they say, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We haven't. You know what, Lord? Sometimes we ignore the cries of the needy. You know what, Lord? Sometimes it's more about us than it is about you. You know what, Lord? I've had some sins in my life and I'm sitting here today and I'm saying it again. Help. Or we can say, Lord, is this the time when you give me the perfect church? Who's the servant and who's the, who's the Lord? Amen? Amen? See, if we're servants, we can hear what Jesus is about to say. If we're servants, we can hear Jesus say, you know what, it is not for you to know the time or the period that the Father is set by his own authority. Many biblical scholars believe that Jesus is referring to his own second coming. So you know how every so often some religious person will say, well, the second coming is going to come on this date. You've, you've lived through that like I have. And everybody gets all excited. And then even though those of us who aren't excited are like, well, maybe I should head my bets a little bit. I don't know. It could happen. And, and, and then guess what? It never happens. You know why? Because if you figure out the date, that scripture says God's just going to change it. God's just going to change it. Why? It's not, read it with me, it's not for you to know the times or the periods. What Jesus is saying is it's not about the moment when it all gets perfect. It's about who we are and whether we have a sense of belonging in the kingdom of God. Do you belong to God is my question. Do you have confidence? Do you have assurance that you belong to God and in this church, do you belong to each other? Or are you feeling sort of on the periphery? Are you feeling on the edge? Do you ever widen the circle? I had this uh, couple, they came to us. I served this mid-sized church out in the Shindo Valley, rural community. People, people always thought they were friendly because they liked each other, but when new people came in, frankly, sometimes they weren't that friendly. So we had to work on friendly. 
Because friendly isn't just, do I say hello to my friends? Friendly is, when somebody brand new walks in, do I care? Do I, do I open the circle and let them in? Tom and Kay came to us because they had been attending a church down the road. I won't tell you which, which church it was. But they said, you know what? We've been going there for months, and we still feel like we're visitors. We just, we just feel like we can't wedge ourselves into relationships. People don't invite us over. People don't really know who we are. Even after months of attending, we, we're still visitors. And they said, we want to know if we can have the experience. And so they came for a few weeks. They liked the church, and they thought Tom's Brook United Methodist Church was a fine place to attend. And then I said, hey, if you all really, really want to feel like you belong, then what you need to do is join us at the fair booth. Well, that church had a, fair, had, a, had a concession booth at the county fair. And it was big because we had Martha's bean soup, which is another story for another time. But everybody in the county, in Shenandoah County, knew about Martha's bean soup. And so we had this fair booth, and we had hamburgers and french fries, and we grew the potatoes ourselves, and then we kicked them out of the ground, and then we cut them up. I mean, it was the whole thing, y'all. And so we were there in the fair booth, and I said, Tom and Kay, you need to sign up for the fair booth. It was a Thursday night and it was the night of the demolition derby, which was a big night at the fair, at the fair booth. Really big, because people love, you know what, people don't want to like the demolition derby, but they love the demolition derby. And so it was a big night, and all the people were there, and Tom and Kay walked in, like at five in the afternoon, when it was kind of, it was, it was calm, because the fair didn't crank up to about 6.30. And so they, they walked in, and all of a sudden I look back at one point, and Kay is out front, and she is just slinging cooks. And, and then we got crowds of people trying to get food, and she's doing, she's taking money and talking to people, and she's got this hair wrap around her hair, because it's hot inside the fair booth. And Tom, he's back on the french frying machine. And the, have you ever been on a french frying machine? It's super hot, it's hot, oil and he's like getting the french fries out and he's dumping them he's shoveling them into the little things he's handing them to Kay and and finally he says he yells hey Kay and she says what and he goes I wonder what the people are doing at that other church we visited (laughs) (laughs) that was Thursday Sunday morning Tom and Kay walked in and people said, hey, Tom, how are you doing? Did you survive? Kay, you were so great the other night. Hey, come on over and sit with us. Hey, we're going to have a picnic for everybody who worked at the fair and everybody in the church. Just, can you all, you want to come to the picnic? And they had the picnic, and Tom and Kay walked up to me, and Tom said, hey, you know what? I said, well, he goes, we feel like we belong. You hear what I'm saying? because they stopped looking for perfect. But they did what Jesus said. And in this text, you're gonna see it. Go go to the next slide, let's see if I can just find it. Look at verse eight, would you read it with me? But you will receive power. Oh, stop there, we gotta pause. Verse eight, say that first line really loud with me, ready? But you will receive power. You know, I feel like the choir is not contributing to the reading out loud. Do you? I mean, I, I'm not hearing them. Are you all hearing them? So, can you hear the choir? No. Can the choir do better? I mean, after we, I think they've just been reveling in the applause. I think we've got to pick it up. So I want you all to really give us loud, receive power. Okay, we're all going to read it, but I want you all to really hit receive power. But you will receive power. That was good when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know, it's really interesting. That's the outline of the book of Acts. Luke's giving you his outline in one sentence because the book of Acts is how the church's ministry began in Jerusalem and then in Judea, which is the outside countryside, and then in Samaria, which was the place that nobody wanted to go because nobody liked Samaritans. Because Jewish people were so bigoted about Samaritan people, they didn't know what to do. Like it was culturally built into them to be that way. And so nobody wanted to go to Samaria. You know in John's Gospel, Jesus made them go to Samaria. Remember the woman at the well? And people always focus on the woman at the woman at the well. Like how is Jesus talking to the woman at the well? The big story in that text, in my mind, is that at the end of the encounter, 
the people of Samaria come and say, would you come and stay with us? And Jesus makes his disciples stay in the homes of the Samaritans for a couple of days. They would have hated that. Does Jesus ever make you do things you hate? Does he? Anybody? Ever had that experience? Anybody? Raise your hand. If Jesus ever made you do something you didn't want to do, raise your hand. Yeah. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, you need to get to know our Lord a little more. Because if you're only doing things you like, you're not in deep enough water in the Christian faith. And what Jesus gives them is power. Can you say power? Power. And a promise. promise. And the power is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Which is to say, as you do the work of the church, you're never alone. As you try to love people, you don't have to do that on your own. You can tap into the power of of the Holy Spirit that will allow you to love people that you never thought you'd care about. The power of the Holy Spirit will enable you to sometimes talk about your faith when you're really uncomfortable. Methodists aren't that great at talking about our faith in Jesus. Have you ever noticed that? We get a little awkward, a little shy. I found years ago that one of the things the Lord made me do that was really uncomfortable for me is he said, I want you to start talking about me in everyday conversations, when you're in a hospital, when you're in regular conversations with people that aren't church people. And so you know what I found is that um, people would talk to me about things, people I just met, and at the end of the conversation, they would sometimes share with me things like I'm dealing with cancer or, or I'm worried about my child or whatever, and I just started saying to them, would you mind if I would start praying for you? I don't know if you're a believer, in God or not, and in Christ, but I am. And I'd like to pray for you. Would you mind if I would do that? And sometimes I would do it right then, if it was a private thing, or you know, if, if it wasn't going to make them feel weird. And you know what I discovered is that whenever I said to people, would you mind if I would pray for you? They always said, guess what they said? Yes. yes. I even had a guy one time who said, I don't really believe any of that, but I guess it can't hurt anything. And I said, what if I'm right and God already cares about your situation is working to make it better? And that led to a deeper. But I didn't do it because I'm so clever or I had a lot of training. I just did it because I said, Holy Spirit, what would you like me to do in this moment? And there was a promise that I would be his, what's the word up there? His witness. Friends, I want you to look around the congregation for just a moment. I want you to look around this room, this room. I want you to notice the blank spots. Do do you see the parts that have room? By the way, if you've got some blank spots, that that doesn't mean there's a crisis, doesn't mean everything's falling apart. It just means we've got some room here. Amen? We've got some room here. I'll give you something else. You, You fill this one up, she'll just start another worship service. Church I left had four worship services before COVID. Four of them, 8, 9, 15, 11, and 5 p.m. And that 5 p.m. was tough. You had to want it. But if you as a congregation, instead of sitting here saying, give me, Lord, is this the time when you will restore to me the kingdom of God? And you know what we're saying is, hey, Jesus, you do the work. But instead, what Jesus says to his disciples is, I'm not doing all the work. You are going to be my witnesses. And I'm going to send you everywhere. Where it feels secure, like Jerusalem. Where it feels mostly secure, like Judea. Even into Samaria. Even into the ends of the earth. And when you get to the end of the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul is standing before the Roman emperor talking about Christ. Ends of the earth. That's what the power of the Holy Spirit will do. And, and I just want to commend you. Patty walked me through your facility so I could learn more about your ministry. I actually called her this week. I said, tell me about your church. She told me about, told me about the wonderful clothes closet where you don't just help people get clothes, you, you learn their stories. You talk to people. You, you, you try to help them feel like they belong. Right? It's not that we're the people with the clothes and you're the people who need clothes. It's like we're all in this community. Come on in. 
What if, and I hope you do this, what if every time somebody came to the closed closet, they got an invitation to be a part of the church in some way? What if you also said, you've got a, a thriving women's Bible study here. And what if the women in the closed closet said, hey, you know what, we've got this Bible study on whatever day of the week that meets. Why don't you come join us? If you need transportation, I'll come by and pick you up. What if every time the men's group met, you guys began to pray? Because you've got this vibrant men's group. What if you began to all say, write down the name of a man you know who's not in the room, but who's out in the community? I don't mean just a man who's a member of the church who doesn't come, but somebody who doesn't really know the Lord. Maybe it's a neighbor. What if you all committed to write those names down, put them on the table, and just pray for those people? And the prayer would be, Lord, give us a chance to help this man belong with us. It would, it would change how you would interact. It would open up invitations. Because you've already got the vital men's ministry, but you've got room. What, what if... What if when you get together and you give food to people through your food pantry, and you probably already do this. My bet is you already do this. I bet you pray with them, don't you? Do you ever do that? Does somebody know? Do you pray with the people who come to the food pantry? Yes or no? Yeah, you do. You do pray with them. See, that's so powerful because what it says is, I don't just care about giving you this stuff. I care about your life. Thank you for that practice. You are Jesus' witnesses. Oh, I know. I, as your new bishop, you know what I want? I want a magic wand for the United Methodist Church. And every so often, I'm like, Lord, you moved me to Florida. <laughs> they didn't ask me my opinion about that. Like, it could have been any state in the southeast jurisdiction. They, didn't, they don't care what I think. They just sent me. And you know what I want to do? I want to say, hey, Lord, since I'm here, wouldn't it be awesome if you would bring the kingdom of God to earth and give us all the perfect churches? Wouldn't it be great? Because here's what I'm really thinking. Then people will think I did it. And you know what the Lord said to me? You'll be my witness. You'll be my servant. Oh, but it's so good when you serve Jesus. Because when you really serve Jesus, you get out of the way and you let the Holy Spirit do the work. And there's love and grace and forgiveness and kindness and compassion and justice and mercy. All the things I've ever wanted in my life he gives me the opportunity to pursue. Isn't it wonderful? Seriously, isn't it wonderful? Hey, friends, isn't it wonderful? It is. It's wonderful that Jesus gives us a chance to belong to his ministry. And that's our work. So I want to ask you to pray about your life as we close. And just hold your life up and say this, this maybe quietly in the silence of your heart. Jesus, how do you want me to serve? How do you want me to be your witness? Because once you're in the fair booth, once the sweat's coming off your brow, that's when you actually discover you belong to God and each other. Amen? Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Lord, I've gone over the time limit, and yet they've been patient. We've opened our lives to you this morning in worship. We've heard beautiful music. We've heard announcements about the life of the congregation. We've prayed for people we love. Now we pray, and we ask you to look at into our individual hearts and in our communal space as a church, and with this question, Lord, how can I be your witness and serve you.
I pray that's a conversation that you continue all this week, Lord. And that through that conversation, people would again and again open their lives to the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of love, the power of grace, and the ability to share the goodness of your life and ours with those who don't know it, that all may come to know your love and goodness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, I invite you to pray that prayer this week. How can I be your witness? If you really do that, it's biblical prayer. How can I be your witness? If you'll do that every day and start your day that way, it'll change your behaviors. It'll change what you do and what you commit to. And this life in Christ, it's really about that. It's not about sitting back saying, Lord, when will you do it for me? It's about being the person God is making you. Amen. Reverend Dr. David Allen, would you come up here? And come on over to, if we can use this microphone, Brenda, that'd be all right. I'm going to ask um, David, who's a member of, of the cabinet in the Florida Conference and your district superintendent, I'm going to ask him to, to give the benediction. Would you do that? Thank you. Can we put our hands together for a phenomenal sermon from Bishop Tom Berlin? And also for this phenomenal accompanist. Wasn't that phenomenal? Excellent. Thank you so much. Let us pray. Oh, Holy One, O oh, Gracious One, we thank you for what our eyes have seen, what our ears have heard, what our hearts have felt and received. Now may the love of God, the Lordship and leadership of Jesus Christ, and the peace of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
See y'all later.